Good morning, church. Good morning for those of you online. Good morning to you. Glad you could join us in that way. Happy first weekend of spring break. Feels like spring, right? <laughs> Woo, here in Oregon. We had summer on Wednesday. It's over. So we're back. We're back into it. Um, Hey, we have three roses here on the platform, and we put roses on the stage just to symbolize when someone has put their faith in Jesus, has begun new life with Jesus. So this past week at our food pantry ministry, Feed Salem, we had three pray to receive Christ. So would you celebrate that with me? That's pretty great. Now, we are serving currently three times as many people at Feed Salem as we did last year. And so we need a little bit of help. We could use a little bit of food or financial help so that we can continue to meet physical and spiritual needs. So in the lobby after the service, you'll see that we have some papers with some signups. They're lists, not signups, lists of things that you can bring in and collection barrels at each end. And if you just want to blow past those, but next time you're shopping, grab a can of chili, bring it back to church, put it in the bin. That would be a great thing. Two weeks ago also, we commissioned our high school students and team on their way to Mexico. Here's a picture of them. This is before the drive. That's why they have the smiles. <laughs> 25 hours later, they are there safely and they're actually on the house builds this morning, starting their work. And so we wanna pray for the roses and we wanna pray for the student ministry team. So would you join me? Jesus, thank you so much. Um, for Feed Salem and for the opportunity to pray with people. And we thank you for those three that confess you as Lord of their life. I pray that their roots would grow deep, that you would bring Christian community around them to encourage them, that they would grow strong in you and bear fruit. And that this would just be the beginning, that you would continue to bring people to you through that ministry. We also pray for our student ministry team, for students and leaders, that you would bless them with energy and safety and joy and fun and wisdom and discernment and all of those amazing things as they partner together to serve you. And I pray that you would just dig deep in their lives, that this would be a pivotal moment in their faith journey. So we trust that you're going to do amazing things there. And as we dive into your word, Holy Spirit, move in this place, as you always do. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All of us have experienced moments where we knew we were in way over our heads. Moments when something has been asked of us that is just well beyond us. You know the moments, the moments where you're like, uh, oh no, not me. No, nah, I'm not going to do that. You're not asking that of me. Those are the moments. The first mission trip I ever led, I took rural Pennsylvania high school students to East Harlem, New York City, because I thought that is the cross-cultural experience that they need. So we loaded up, we went to New York City. One night we went to this busy street corner to do an outreach night. We put a cord through a second story window. We set up a movie projector, a legit movie projector, a screen, a sound system, and we showed the movie The Cross and the Switchblade in Spanish. Uh, it's based on the book by David Wilkerson. It starred Eric Estrada. Anybody in here? <laughs> Not in, yeah, okay, some of you just dated myself as well. Yes, absolutely. So we showed this movie. So if you can get this picture on, on this street corner here, it's dark. Bunch of rural students, wide-eyed, watching a movie that they don't understand and so many people stopping to stare. Not at the movie, at the spectacle that was us. Now, I'm kind of vacillating in this moment between uncomfortable and engaged. I'm uncomfortable because it's my job to keep these students safe, and so I'm trying to figure out where everybody is and make sure nobody's wandered off, and I'm really hoping that this isn't the story that they take home to their parents. It was late at night, we're on a street corner, it was awesome. No. And I'm trying to be engaged. I'm trying to pay attention to a movie that I have no idea what's going on in because I want to support the church in this outreach. And I have no real investment in the success of this outreach outside of those two things. Keep the kids safe. Pretend like you know what's going on. All that changed in a moment when I see the lead pastor walking my way. And I did what any good young pastor would do. I avoided eye contact. 
we've all done that before, right? We know something's coming and we're like, oh, I'm busy with something else. So he comes over to me and he says, hey, I would really love for you to do the altar call at the end of this movie. Now, a lot of things were going through my mind in this moment, chiefly the word, no, <laughs> no, I don't, I don't want to do that. You don't, you don't understand. I'm not qualified to do this. If you knew me, if you really knew me, you would not ask this of me. I'm called to ministry, but not this ministry. <laughs> but it wasn't so much that he was asking, he was telling me. And he put a microphone in my hands and all of the sudden, I'm off the bench and I'm into the game. And so the movie ends and I stand there holding the microphone and I gave the altar call of my life. If Billy Graham would have been there, he would have recommitted. <laughs> um, didn't go that way. <laughs> In actuality, I was like, um, there was this guy, he had a knife, it was a switchblade, and um, there was some gang activity. And I think that there was a pastor because it looked like he had a Bible and Jesus loves you and you should pray to receive him. <laughs> Amen. Now I cleaned that up for you a little bit. It was worse in real time. <laughs> M much worse. But this is kind of a nightmare scenario for Christians. We all have fears as Christians. Maybe it's, it's praying in a group of people, especially if it's popcorn prayer, when you never know when to start that prayer because you're afraid you'll be praying over someone else. Or maybe it's trying to pronounce names in the genealogy. Or maybe it's being told you have to go to the middle school all nighter and volunteer. But mostly it is this idea of, you know, it's a street corner and I have to present the gospel or I have to stand up in front of a group of people that I don't know and share about Jesus. And sure, there are things that intimidate us in our faith, but they should not sideline us. You see, the world doesn't need us on the bench. The world needs us on mission. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. This idea, a very simple idea that we have been invited in to be sent out. We've been invited in to be sent out. We see this all throughout Scripture. God invites Abraham to come close, and then he sends him out. At the burning bush, God invites Moses on mission, sends him back to Egypt. God invites Isaiah in for healing, he sends him out to preach. God invites his disciples in to follow him. Jesus has disciples so that he can send them out. And this is for all of us. This is for all of us who are disciples of Jesus. We have been invited in so that we can be sent out. We're continuing on in our series in the book of Matthew, Unexpected King, and today we're talking about unexpected mission, where we get to be the peace and the presence and the power of Jesus. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 9. We're going to start in verse 35. You can turn there. This passage begins a shift, a major shift in the book of Matthew. The first semester of Jesus' teaching, the one about Christian living, that's concluded. The second semester of Jesus' teaching, the one about Christian mission, it's just beginning. And so in Matthew chapter 4, we see Jesus, he goes out to be tempted in the wilderness. He calls his first disciples and he begins ministry. This is the first movement in Matthew and it begins with this verse. Matthew 4, 23, Jesus traveled throughout the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. This verse kicks off his public ministry. And from chapter four until chapter nine, where we're gonna start, you see Jesus, his words and his works. And you see the disciples, but the disciples are only watching and learning. But when we get to this passage, the second movement kicks off with the exact same verse we just read. It'll seem very familiar to you when I read it again. But this is phase two. And in phase two, Jesus is showing us what he requires of those who follow him, what he requires of his disciples. So if you have your Bibles, Matthew 9, starting in verse 35, this should be a familiar verse since I just read it in chapter four. Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogue and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. 
Chapter 10, verse 1, Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. And he sent them out. We're going to talk about what the message was that Jesus preached and that he sent his disciples out with and then what the mission is. The message and the mission. You see, we have to understand the message before we will go out on mission. And in verse 35, we see it. Jesus was announcing the good news about the kingdom. He was proclaiming the gospel. Now, when Matthew used this word gospel, it had significant meaning, but not religious meaning like we think. It had significant cultural meaning. It was a very cultural word back then. It meant news that brings joy, but not just the daily news, because we know the daily news doesn't exactly bring joy. It means history-making, life-shaping news. There's an ancient Roman inscription written about Caesar Augustus that begins this way. This is the gospel of Caesar. And it's the story of his birth and his ascension to the throne. When Greece won a battle over Persia, Pheidippides, he was the evangelist runner. He ran all the way from Marathon to Athens, 26 miles, to deliver the gospel. History tells us that this was a gospel message that he gave, and he says this, the battle is over, we are free, joy to you. And tradition tells us that those were his last words, and he passed away. And I've never run a marathon, I can't say, but I might have had a similar thing. But isn't that a beautiful message? (laughs) The battle is over, we are free, joy to you. That's the gospel. That is the gospel message. It's about news that has changed our standing forever. You see, the gospel isn't just advice. The gospel isn't a set of rules. The gospel is based in an actual event, an event that changes our status forever. And it's a gospel of freedom. We don't have to earn our way to God. We don't have to suffer under the weight of performance. What Jesus has done for us is way more important than anything we could ever do for him. And his sacrifice is our salvation. This is the gospel message. This is the good news. And we will never go on mission until we've been transformed by this message. But once we've experienced that message, once we are disciples of Jesus and we've been transformed, then we are called to go on mission. This is what Jesus has been working towards. He's been proclaiming the gospel. We've heard his words. We've seen his works. And now he's handing it over to his disciples. He's freely giving it to them. As soon as he says that, he he says, pray that God would send. And now I'm sending you. And he sent them out with authority. Verse 7, go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy, and cast out demons. Give as freely as you have received. You see, the disciples were moving from recipients to representatives. This is their moment where they get off the bench and into the game. This is where they become fishers of men. And as I read this, quite honestly, my first thought is this. Seriously, God? These guys, you're trusting the future of the world to these guys? And I mean no disrespect to the disciples because what I really think my questioning is rooted in is that somehow that responsibility also ends up in my hands. And I'm deeply honored and yet somewhat suspicious of a God who would trust me with that much. (laughs) And I'm like, really, God? This guy? Me? Isn't there a slightly less impactful job that you want me to do? Like, couldn't I go get snacks for the real disciples? Like, couldn't I go out and get some loaves and fish? It seems like that's what they like, so I could go out and find some of that. Like, do we ever feel that way? Like, man, that's a lot of responsibility, and I hope that's not on my shoulders. But here's the thing. Disciples of Jesus are given important roles in the kingdom. And mission is kind of the goal. Mission's the end game. Mission is what Jesus is driving at. Now, he gives a couple things that are going to help us get on mission. But he wants us to be on mission. The first thing we see that helps us get there is in verse 36. It starts with compassionately seeing people. Jesus wants to transform the way that we see people. 
It says he had compassion on them. And we talked about that a couple weeks ago. Compassion is just that deep feeling in your gut. Literally, it means to be moved in your bowels, which isn't exactly polite, but that's just this sense of something's moving in you and there's action that's going to happen. You're going to have this kind of action because the people are confused and helpless. Confused is just victimized. It means that they were harassed with unrelenting demands, with competing ideologies. They were helpless. It means that they were cast aside. And this is largely an indictment upon the Pharisees because the Pharisees were doing the confusing and the harassing. You see, they created a religion that was far more rules than it was relationship. It was all about regulations. They gave people a back-breaking amount of things to do and no grace. The Pharisees were using the encouragement cards in the pews for discouragement. This is what they were doing. In church, any religion that's void of transformational grace and the resurrected Jesus is going to lead to people being confused and harassed and helpless. And that's why Jesus invites us in before he sends us out. He invites us in for hope and for healing and for wholeness so he can send us out with peace and presence and power. And he wants to send us out to the world, to people, and he wants to transform the way that we see them. You see, the Pharisees saw people as sinners to be destroyed and Jesus saw them as people that needed to be saved. The Pharisees saw people as chaff that needed to be burned up. Jesus saw people as a harvest that he wanted to bring in. Church family, I would ask us this question, how do we see people? How do we see people? Not, not your inner circle, not your people, but how do we see people in our community, in this city, in the world? Do we see them like the Pharisees? as people that just need to kind of go away or, or be destroyed? Or do we see them like Jesus, as people who need to be loved? There's a famous painting by Vincent Van Gogh. It's called Self-Portrait with Bandaged Ear. And if you're familiar at all with the life of Van Gogh, you know that he wrestled with some significant inter, inner turmoil. And by his own admission, he was quite broken. And by his artwork, we see that he's quite brilliant. And this self-portrait is the result of him actually cutting off a large portion of his ear in one of his seasons of wrestling. And here's the thing. We would never post this picture. We would never talk about this moment, but I love the fact that it's out there. You see, this is a brutally honest portrait where he captured his defining moment of shame and need for rescue. And the irony of this painting is that it's a portrait of brokenness and now it's a priceless work of art. This is how God sees us. God understands that oftentimes we're just a portrait of brokenness and yet to him we are a priceless masterpiece. And this is how we need to see other people. It's okay to understand. It's okay to see that there's brokenness in the world, but we need to see people as infinitely valuable. Jesus wants to transform the way that we see people because when we see them that way, it will help us to get on mission. The second thing that we see as it relates to being on mission is he wants to, us to have a harvest mindset. Jesus talks about the fact that the harvest is ready. There are people that need to experience the hope of the gospel. I could spend the entire sermon talking about the needs of the world, but I think you understand that. I think you see the needs of the world every day. And Jesus in this passage is reminding us that being on mission is understanding that the harvest won't get reaped until the reapers reap it. The harvest won't be reaped until the reapers reap it. That's what it means to be on mission. And I think sometimes we have a real narrow view of mission. I opened with that story in East Harlem of standing on the street corner. And somehow that's become like a dominant image of what it is to be on mission for Jesus. And quite honestly, it scares us and we don't like it because it's confrontational. It feels like it's finger pointing, it's arrogance, it's superiority. And because of our distaste for this method, We've discarded the message. 
Because of our distaste for a particular method, we've discarded the message, we've discarded the mission, but mission is multifaceted and all human pain is mission material. Anything we do in the name of Jesus that brings freedom is us being on mission. It's us praying, it's us serving, it's us loving people, it's providing clothing, it's purchasing a can of chili and bringing it to church, it's freeing people from religious shame and burdens, it's tearing down corrupt systems. All of these good deeds are good news. And Jesus wants us to understand that there's a harvest out there. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to reduce the distance between us and those in need. Because too often we can stand back and he wants to transform our vision of how we see people. And he wants us to understand that we need to get off the bench and into the game. There is a harvest. Matthew 28 is the great commission where Jesus says, I've invited you in. It's been good. It's your turn. Go get them. Here's the authority. I've invited you in to send you out. And church family, we need to move from recipients to representatives as well. And there's just two things in closing that I want to focus on, two things that we can lean into. The first is prayer and the second is practice. The first thing Jesus talks about is prayer. These verses are a call to action. And the first action is prayer. Jesus didn't say, I want you to form a committee I need you to get a focus group together to judge the feasibility of a brand new harvest campaign. He didn't hire a PR guy so that his social media would look good. He said, pray. The first command isn't go, it's pray. And we pray because it says the Lord is in charge of the harvest and we aren't. And we pray because when we are faced with an impossible task, we have to go to the one in whom all things are possible. Jesus, who, who can do anything, says, I need you to pray for more workers so that our mindset turns into that. He didn't say, okay, I got a couple workers out there. I'm just going to give them gospel superpowers and it's going to be fine. He said, I need more workers. I want to partner with you in this. Pray. Mission Mission is born out of prayer. The seminal moment of the missions movement in North America can be traced back to 1806, where five people went out into this open field to pray that God would release people out into the world. It started pouring down rain, and so they hid under a haystack. I really have no mental image of why that's a good idea, but that's what they did, and it's called the haystack movement. And they prayed that week and the next week and the next week and again and again and again. And within 50 years, they had sent out over 1,200 people on mission. You see, we don't make this happen ourselves. We pray for this making. And so I would challenge us as a church, would you pray with me in this coming week that God would send more people on mission? that God would send workers into the harvest. But don't just pray for other people. That would be the easy thing to do, and we should do that. And so don't just be like, okay, God, I'm good, but there's a lot of other people out there that could go. Pray and ask God, what's my part? God, who are you sending me to even this week? And so the first thing that we need to do is pray. And the second thing is we just need to start putting these things into practice. We need to start doing these things. Verse 38, I just love it. We just talked about it. Pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his field. The word send here is a strong word. It means to, to throw. It means to cast out forcibly. It's actually the same word as chapter 10, verse 1, where the disciples were given the authority to cast out demons. So Jesus is saying, pray that the Lord of the harvest will, will cast out workers. Our big idea could be we've been invited in to get kicked out. That's what it is. It's as if Jesus is saying, the workers are already there. They're already on the bench, or as we call it in church, the pews. They're there. They just need to be cast out into their extended families, into their workplaces, into their neighborhoods. They need to be cast out into the beautiful and breathtaking work of God. They need to be cast out with community and instruction and authority because this is how the gospel moves forward. This is how the kingdom advances and all of us are a part of it. It's not just the people that work here at Salem Alliance. It's not just professional Christians. It's all of us. 
Every one of us gets to be a part of this. And so here's some practical ideas. After we pray, we want to put things into practice. Here's what we can practice. I, in large part, am standing here on this platform because when I was four years old, friends of my parents took a risk, invited them to church, and they met Jesus. And I got to grow up in a great church and in a great family with faith. And I want you to think about for a minute, think about your story. Who was it that invited you? And maybe this week you even write them a note of thanks. You send them a text, you call them, you actually write it down on paper. Send them a note of thanks because this is a beautiful reminder of our part of this, the role that we have in this mission. Sometimes it's just an invitation. Easter's in a couple weeks. Maybe there's an invitation you can make to somebody and invite them to the Easter service. And beyond the invitation, maybe there's an introduction. Maybe God's had someone on your heart for quite a season, and it's time for you to make this introduction to Jesus. And I love that idea. You're just introducing somebody to Jesus. You're just allowing them to see who he is, and it's a beautiful thing. I never worry about introducing people to my wife because I know immediately they're going to see her gentleness and her kindness. And really, the only negative thing about introducing people to my wife is the comments that come back at me like, what does she see in you? <laughs> or you married up. And I'm like, yes, all guys marry up. That's just what we do. <laughs> introducing people to Jesus. Maybe it's an invitation. Maybe it's an introduction. Mission is just using what God has already placed in us. We talked about the GPS in January. We talked about spiritual gifts and maybe you have hospitality, so invite people in. Maybe you have craftsmanship. Bless someone with the works of your hands. Maybe you have leadership as a gift. And I would ask if you're serving on some kind of committee or commission or board so that you can be salt and light. Church family, there are words of healing and hope that will never get spoken unless we speak them. There are deeds of courage and kindness and compassion that will never get done unless we do them. Back to that corner in East Harlem. I was standing there. I've already told you how I delivered the altar call of my life. And the crazy thing is, people responded. And they didn't respond because of any verbal brilliance of my own, any wisdom I was giving. This is absolutely a case of not because of me, but in spite of me. God worked. And I believe God is just calling us to be faithful, and he honors that obedience as we step out on mission. God will honor that. He's in charge of the harvest. I just finished a biography of Amy Carmichael. She spent her life on mission in India. And this quote just resonated with me. She said, there have been times of late when I've had to hold on to one text with all my might. 1 Corinthians 4.2 says, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Praise God, it does not say successful. We trust that success to Jesus, but we are faithful to be on mission. He has invited us in to send us out to be peace and presence and power to the world. Amen? Amen. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for your word. Jesus, this morning, I thank you that you have invited us. What an honor. What a beautiful thing to be invited into who you are, and I pray that you would continue to transform us with that message. But I pray that you would open our eyes Open our eyes to the world. Open our eyes to people. Open our eyes to the surrounding situations and circumstances that we live in so that we can be on mission. Jesus, we just want to bring you glory. We just want to bring fame to your name. We just want to be faithful to you, and we trust you with the results. And we love you, Jesus, in your name. Amen.